Assalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us for this uh, special event uh, of uh, uh, COVID-19 and especially uh, what can the general practitioner can do for this uh, uh, pandemic. Uh, INAS, which is the international network of uh, Algerian scientists, is the platform that uh, uh, let us meet uh, through it and discuss the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Shukran ala indimamikum fi uh, virtual meeting لنتكلم عن الكوفيد 19 وخاصة بما يقوم به uh, الطبيب العام. I will introduce one of my uh, colleagues that works with me at uh, Mount Vista Medical Center and also he works at Banner Hospital, Dr. Peter uh, Stola. He is uh, a pulmonologist and also he's specialist in intensive care unit. Uh, he works in two hospitals and also he's involved in the research of uh, uh, convalescent plasma. He will discuss a uh, little bit about mainly the COVID-19 in the uh, ICU. Uh, then Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Dinar will summarize uh, his uh, talk. Uh, please welcome Dr. Stola, uh, Piotr, and uh, without uh, further ado, you can start. Uh, good afternoon and good evening in some places. Uh, my name is Piotr Stola. I'm a pulmonologist uh, and critical care specialist uh, and practice in Arizona. We work with Dr. Saduk in uh, uh, the same hospital, in the teaching hospital, teaching residents. And um, we certainly uh, have uh, unprecedented times in, in regards to um, pandemic. Um, not the worst this um, human race has seen, but uh, certainly uh, worst of our times. So, um, as you may know, um, the patients who are presenting to, um, to our facilities, uh, they present a variety of symptoms, and they are fairly typical uh, for this uh, particular disease, although there are some um, nuances, but um, we deal with uh, patients who are severely ill. Um, I think we're trying to kind of discuss um, what happens on the other spectrum, which means uh, patients in the community, patients who are coming to general practitioners. Um, so I will um, discuss a little bit um, what happens when they really get ill. Um, and then the question is how to quickly uh, identify them and um, identify those patients who potentially um, uh, spread the disease and isolate them and, and treat them accordingly. So, Dr. Stola, I, Dr. Stola you have uh, 20 minutes and I will remind you one, two minutes left. Sounds good. So then we start the question. Okay, so um, Obviously, um, you know, this situation is unprecedented and, you know, we have abundant information um, regarding treatment of COVID-19, especially in critical care settings. And the information is uh, evolving quickly, but um, I would urge everybody to uh, be um, careful with um, <coughs> the information that is being provided. Um, we know that um, the data that comes from limited research um, is uh, not the same data that um, we deal with uh, in the usual situations. Um, it's a fairly limited amount of information. It is presented without, um, uh, without certain um, review sometimes, and um, the quality of uh, that information has to be um, has to be discerned by the providers um, because um, um, it may not have a bearing uh, the same way as um, in the past. Uh, we are dealing with patients who are coming with hypoxic respiratory failure and they are uh, frequently um, developing hypoxia quickly after the initial symptoms. Um, when they are treated with supplemental oxygen, we use um, supplemental oxygen with increasing 
flow eventually get to the point that we have to use high flow oxygen and the patients that are hospitalized universally and are treated with um, multiple m m medications and interventions, the, the one that I wanted to emphasize is the proning therapy, which um, does not cost anything. So um, those patients are encouraged to uh, prone themselves. They usually become ill um, progressively at home. They usually uh, bed bound, they remain in supine position, the inflammatory changes in the lungs we are, which are fairly typical um, uh, develop and um, they are dependent. So they are in the posterior areas in, uh, with the gravity, oxygenation suffers. Um, those patients should not be kept in the supine position. They should be prone, they should be placed on their stomachs as much as possible. We recommend that they only remain uh, supine for meals, otherwise spend all the time in a prone position. That um, has been, in our experience, the determining factor whether the patients um, uh, recover quickly uh, or they, their hypoxic respiratory failure progresses and requires uh, potentially mechanical ventilation. The other thing that we have noticed uh, recently is that um, Patients um, who are um, whose hypoxia progresses and um, they're requiring more and more supplemental oxygen with high flow nasal cannulas. Um, when they get to the point that um, they cannot um, oxygenate appropriately with high flow nasal cannula, we've been lately skipping non invasive positive pressure ventilation, meaning BiPAPs. They seem to delay appropriate treatment and patients who uh, are treated with high flow nasal cannula then end up on non-invasive ventilation. Um, their uh, recovery is delayed when or even sometimes impossible when they eventually uh, get intubated and place in mechanical ventilation. So um, just the last uh, couple of weeks experienced the patients who are fairly early intubated and prone while intubated recover really rapidly and uh, are able to be extubated after um, anywhere between two and five days of mechanical ventilation and um, that rapid um, turnaround uh, influences their um, outcomes through allowing them to be extubated, move on after treatment, avoiding severe deconditioning debility, which results after uh, patients spend a couple of weeks on mechanical ventilation. Um, as Dr. Saduk mentioned, we are using a convalescent plasma, we are using remdesivir, we are using uh, moderate to high dose steroids with dexamethasone. Those patients on mechanical ventilation, we have to remember to check sputum cultures, uh, which are easily obtainable. Um, forgetting to do so when the patient does not improve and the patients are on empiric antibiotics uh, causes delay in potential identification of patients who have bacterial, either secondary infections or primary infections that we misdiagnose. Uh, we have to remember that uh, not everything that looks like COVID is COVID, and we have to be uh, vigilant for other medical conditions that uh, are coexisting and uh, are also causing eventually problems. Very important issue is um, vascular complications, um, vascular complications including thrombosis, uh, checking D-dimer and identifying patients at risk for microthrombosis, uh, since we don't see large clots in those patients, um, it is extremely important because those patients need to be potentially on therapeutic doses of anticoagulation. A lot of them are and trying to avoid uh, microthrombosis, both pulmonary and systemic. Um, the other important thing is um, the increasing amount of data regarding uh, myocarditis and those patients suffering from cardiac complications. Cardiovascular complications seem to be the one of the leading causes of uh, subsequent morbidity in those patients. We frequently see um, kidney failure, um, kidney failure that at times leads to need for replacement therapy 
meaning dialysis in patients who otherwise have no um, chronic renal insufficiency. A lot of the patients that we treated um, have had undiagnosed diabetes. That's why it's in, very important to check for and those patients who didn't develop over hyperglycemia, but their hemoglobin A1C frequently is in the range of six and a half to seven and a half. They normally would be diagnosed um, sometimes even one to two years ahead and down the road, but um, those patients, we check them because they frequently require, especially with treatment with dexamethasone with stairs, they require escalating uh, doses of um, insulin for treatment. Um, unfortunately, a lot of patients are obese, uh, which kind of is, um, um, uh, has two aspects. So one is um, it's uh, difficult to prone those patients, although uh, they um, historically and um, uh, scientifically, they, we know that they are um, having less uh, general complications uh, when they treat in the intensive care unit um, because of their reserve, lack of uh, the cubitus ulcers, et cetera, et cetera. Um, generally, it's a difficult uh, disease to treat, uh, requires multi-specialty approach, requires early recognition, and I think um, the general practitioners can make uh, a lot of difference uh, by early and identifying those patients, isolating their families as much as possible. Um, we've had one of our providers who was ill with uh, COVID-19 and introducing early proning positioning and appropriate nutrition and early treatment uh, makes a lot of difference. Uh, thank you, Dr. Stola. Those are very important information that you gave us and uh, very valuable, especially in the COVID-19. And those that are totally different uh, from what we used to do uh, in, the, in the ICU for the patient. Uh, I just like to uh, summarize uh, what uh, Dr. St Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dinar, if you want to summarize, or I want to summarize quick for what uh, Dr. Stola said, so our colleagues in uh, the rest of the okay. world can understand. Okay. Uh, Dr. Dinar, Dr. Dinar is a specialist in uh, neurology, and he's also a specialist in sleep study and electrophysiology. He is the head of, uh, he's the director of uh, uh, neurology service in uh, uh, Albany, St. Peter's. St. Peter's Hospital Albany. in Albany, uh, New York. Please, uh, welcome. Do you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Oh, th thank you, uh, Dr. Piotr. It uh, was a, a very uh, informative uh, talk. Um, uh, to summarize this, je voudrais seulement faire un sommaire de ce que Dr. Piotr a présenté. Um, il, est, il, a, il a mentionné que les malades euh, atteints du COVID sont des malades euh, critiques qui arrivent au niveau des, des soins intensifs. Euh, il a aussi euh, euh, mis l'importance de l'identification rapide des, des malades et de les isoler de leur famille. Euh, afin de, de commencer un, un, un traitement. Euh, il a aussi euh, euh, mentionné que les malades demandent une oxygénération qui est, euh, qui est euh, progressive, euh, généralement due à une hypoxie respiratoire, euh, euh, à cause de l'inflammation qui se passe au niveau des, des poumons, les malades euh, recevant une oxygénation euh, progressive peuvent s'améliorer ou bien ils, euh, ils euh, demandent à être mis sous ventilation assistée. Il a mentionné qu'il faut éviter euh, une certaine ventilation euh, appelée BiPAP which is in uh, uh, respiration uh, sous pression, uh, qui uh, généralement a fait perdre 
aux, aux malades un temps précieux pour les traiter euh, à temps. Ce qui fait que les, quand vous voyez que le malade est, euh, euh, a besoin de, de plus en plus d'oxygène, donc il, euh, il ne peut plus euh, subvenir à ses, euh, à ses besoins respiratoires, il faut l'intuber. Et il a mentionné que euh, les malades doivent être mis en position prone parce que euh, la plupart de euh, l'inflammation so, euh, euh, s'installe euh, au niveau des parois postérieures du poumon, ce qui fait que les mettre en position prone, ça veut dire que sur leur ventre, ils améliorent leur rapidité, leur ventilation avec euh, les machines. Euh, et, et il récupère plus ra rapidement euh, et les mettre seulement en leur position de, de, sur le dos euh, seulement pour les faire nourrir. Euh, il a aussi euh, mentionné qu'il euh, y a euh, des malades qui se compliquent à cause de leur obésité, qui, qui, que c'est certainement il est difficile de tourner les malades obèses sur leur ventre. Euh, il a aussi mentionné que certains malades euh, succombent ou ont des complications qui euh, euh, retentissent sur leur euh, rapidité de recovery, euh, de, de, euh, de récupération, je voudrais, euh, à cause euh, des, euh, des maladies cardiovasculaires. Il y a des, des malades qui font des thromboses coronaires, euh, des thromboses dans différents organes. Euh, il y a aussi euh, des malades qui, qui font une insuffisance rénale qui nécessite une, une, une dialyse. Et aussi, il y a des malades qui, sont, qui ne sont pas connus comme, euh, comme diabétiques et se révèlent au niveau des de, de, euh, soins intensifs qu'ils étaient euh, des diabétiques euh, qui, qui ont été atteints du, euh, du covid et qu'ils ne le savaient pas. Donc, leur complication est, est, est plus grave et leur récupération et recovery est, est euh, un peu lente. Voilà, en tout euh, ce qu'il a, euh, qu a euh, mentionné. Donc, euh, il a mis l'importance sur euh, les médecins praticiens pour faire attention à ces malades qui se présentent euh, avec, une, euh, avec des détresses respiratoires et les identifier euh, aussi rapidement, les évaluer. Et s'ils demandent un, une oxygénation avec une petite machine qui donne de l'oxygène avec une, euh, une, 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 une rate euh, de 8 ou les 10 litres par minute, sinon si le malade euh, commence à se détériorer, il faut vite aller euh, à l'intubation et éviter le, les, les autres euh, moyens d'améliorer de, de, de la respiration. Merci, so, Dr. Dinar. Uh, Dr. Dinar, vous avez summarisé ce que le Dr. Stola a dit très bien. Vous avez fait tout, vous avez fait tout, vous n'avez pas perdu quelque chose. Merci beaucoup.